you so much for taking the time for this interview. And we'd like first to know what's your definition of Government 2.0? And is it all about ICT adoption or transparency or something different? Uh, I have to say our definition of Government 2.0 is, is relatively unusual. It doesn't contain any of those terms like participation, democracy, transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks at two trends. Uh, socialization, which is you know doing things together uh, among citizens, among employees across government and, and you know and, and the, the public. Mm -hmm. And the second one is commoditization, mm -hmm. which is using commodity technology, which could be you know the internet, could be consumer social network, could be consumer devices mm -hmm. to support the government to citizen delivery. So mm -hmm. the definition is the government 2.0 is the commoditization and socialization of pretty much anything, so services, data, and processes. Mm. So that at the end of this process, which we have no idea how long it's going to take around the world, government becomes part of its environment rather than mm. a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So when we usually hear about government 2.0, we hear about e-participation and uh, citizen inclusion and an empowerment. So how related are these two uh, entities? Uh, those are important concepts. There are like, you know, steps, if you like, in this government 2.0 evolutions. So as soon as you socialize, you clearly make people participate. You have to become more transparent in order for them to understand what you do and give you advice and be engaged in things like service delivery or policy making. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't get mistaken, these are just steps. Uh, the end game of government 2.0 really is that all different boundaries, including organizational boundaries and the, the boundary between government and the public, mm. uh, is going to be uh, completely blurred. And that's the part that I think makes Government 2.0 more difficult to accept mm. from an institutional perspective. Mm -hmm. So you spoke about the, um, uh, how Government 2.0 can embrace social media. And when you spoke about it, you mentioned three different phases, denial and replacement and embracing. So how different and distinct are these three phases and how do they relate to government's use of social media? Well, in some cases, they are phases. In some cases, they're just attitudes. So we mm. find, if we look at our clients around the world, some of them are still in denial uh, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are uh, try to you know, do the same things, uh, creating their own platforms and their own channels. So they try to own this community phenomena. Mm -hmm. And the third category, which is growing, is people who accept that this is, I mean, the train has left the station, basically, mm -hmm. and the only thing you can do is to embrace. You can also look at these three phases as a, you know, as, a, as an evolution. Mm -hmm. But sometimes those who are in denial are so because they have some uh, security or mission criticality issues mm -hmm. that is very difficult to resolve as soon as you accept, well, I'm going to socialize this. So how do you socialize intelligence data? Mm -hmm. How do you socialize, you know, citizen data with other people? Mm -hmm. So I think there are both phases, but also, you know, different ways in which people in government relate to this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So when speaking about um, go government 2.0, you mentioned that very little part of the conversation is speaking about the employee 2.0 and how government employees should should act. So why do you think there is very little part of conversation about that and why is the conversation more leaned through uh, towards uh, new media? I think uh, in every kind of uh, you know strategy or endeavor, governments always try to look at, at, at those issues from an institutional perspective. Mm. So what would government do about electronic services? What should government do about health care? You see, institution versus an issue. Mm. Now, when you look at Web 2.0 and social networks, the fundamental characteristics is that this is people to people. Mm. So if you look at Facebook, people follow other people. Mm. Uh, they follow other people on Twitter. So if you then look at government, you say, well, would citizens follow or will, would they like to be friends with government? Mm -hmm. No, because government is an institution. And the same applies, by the way, to corporations. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the employee dimension is important is that employees are the most important asset in government mm -hmm. as they are the people. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a citizen, I may wish to be connected with persons in government, with the employees. So as soon as you recognize this, you figure out, well, what I really need to do is to understand what employees are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why this is not being discussed so much mm -hmm. is that this becomes more, you know, personal. And, and the point is, governments operate as an institution. Mm -hmm. They rarely allow individuals to have initiative, 
to you know test the boundaries of existing regulations and so forth. But that's exactly what needs to be done if you want to engage with social networks mm -hmm. and get the most out of this government 2.0 trend. Mm -hmm. So you also discussed the use of uh, wikis uh, when governments embrace uh, social media web 2.0. So tell us about the, some of the examples of how wikis can be used in that context. Yes, wikis are just one of the many tools and uh, just traditionally for whatever reason they have been uh, more successful than other tools when you try to apply them inside government. Mm. Um, and there are plenty of examples. For instance, uh, ministries coming from the mergers of different agencies, mm. building a wiki has allowed employees who didn't know each other to start socializing. Other important example when, for instance, the Department of Defense uh, in the United States looks for uh, new capabilities, mm -hmm. wiki is a great tool to allow employees to collaborate to mm -hmm. you know, solve these new challenging problems. Another great example is to use the wiki of, um, in procurement, mm -hmm. when you have, rather than having a consultant writing the request for proposal on your behalf, mm -hmm. you actually have all the possible vendors, the, pub the public at large, if you like, mm -hmm. writing the proposal, the request for proposal for you on a wiki, mm -hmm. which is more transparent, more uh, quicker, I would say, mm -hmm. and allow vendors to understand what you need much earlier in the process. So there are plenty of areas in which wikis have been extremely successful, but they're just a tool. Mm -hmm. I think what people really need to understand tools are the least of their worry. Mm. There are plenty of tools. The point is how do we use the tools to innovate and let people, in this case employees, yeah. get the most out of it. Mm. Okay, so we're interested also to know about the UN e-government survey 2010. Tell us about the main findings of the report and whether you know any findings that can benefit Qatar and the Gulf region in that area. I, I have to say, I, I have a, a, we in Qatar have a very controversial view of, of rankings and mm -hmm. surveys, and we have consistently written since 2005, 2004, they are not particularly helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with any survey, including the UN, is that, uh, you know, every country has a particular context, mm -hmm. okay? So I've been in Bahrain, I've been in, uh, the Emirates have been here. I can sense the differences, how you're dealing with certain priorities, how do you do, you do planning, and so mm -hmm. forth. So having everybody, even in the same region, on the same criteria, in my view, doesn't make too much sense. Mm. This being said, what is interesting in the, in the UN ranking, they look at three different things. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of human capital development, like you know, IT literacy, mm -hmm. le level of education. They look at infrastructure things, like uh, internet penetration, mobile phone penetration. Mm -hmm. And then they have a pretty articulated way of looking at online services. Now, I'm not terribly positive on, on the latter part because it, it's a little bit arbitrary. Mm. But when you look at those more objective numbers like, you know, infrastructure maturity, uh, you know, level of education, those are clearly indicators that Qatar and other countries should look at in terms of uh, looking at what their peers are doing. Mm. So if there is a lower penetration, if there's lower level of education and so forth, those are the most important things to be tackled as opposed to focusing on, you know, how many services do we have online? Mm. Because the ability to use those services will depend on how many people do we have online. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to have the service online? Mm. So I think elements of the survey make a lot of sense. Mm. Taking the service as a ranking, like it was a formerly one race, uh, in my view, doesn't make much sense. Mm -hmm. So in the last segment of our interview, we're really interested to know about the dark side of government 2.0, which intrigued many of the attendees uh, today. So first, tell us about how how this dark side pertains to productivity. And many people are thinking that productivity may be lessened or reduced when governments embrace uh, social media or Web 2.0. So what do you think of that? Yes, let me say, in, in any government organization, actually in any organization, there, there, are, there have always been multiple ways in which people can you know, waste their time. The mm -hmm. coffee machine, reading the newspaper, the internet before 2.0 provides multiple ways of wasting time. Mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all those social networks are an additional potential source of distraction. And like before, it's an entirely management problem. Mm. The manager has to understand what outcome is this employee assumed to produce? And is the use of this tool helping rather than preventing that outcome from being achieved? Mm. Uh, so attitudes like I ban the use of these social networks because this person will be unproductive, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Also because many people today have smartphones. Mm -hmm. So you block Facebook on the network, he or she will use it on the smartphone. So I think the right attitude is, uh, from the productivity perspective, is mm -hmm. to encourage employees uh, like this. Do you want to use Facebook? Well, show me how Facebook can help do you do your job better. Mm 
Mm. So it's put the challenge to those who say, well, I think I want to use Facebook as part of my mindset. Well, you are an employee, use it. Mm. Show me how you can be more productive, as opposed to assuming you want to be productive. Mm. So the challenge, again, goes to the employee rather than to the organization. Mm -hmm. So how does that pertain to accountability when, you, when we speak about the dark side of uh, government? I think accountability is, is, is a tricky thing because the, the way to use these tools effectively is to use on a personal basis. Mm. So as soon as you start blurring your personal identity on mm. Facebook, for instance, your professional identity, you may say things that may be misconstrued as a statement of the government. Mm. So it's very important in order to discharge accountability, to mm. actually be accountable, that Every time I, as an employee, say something, whatever it is, on social networks, people mm -hmm. can understand, is this person saying this on a personal basis or is this an official statement? So mm -hmm. that has to be clearly stated in my you know, Facebook profile mm -hmm. or the LinkedIn profile and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, this won't solve all the problems, but it is, at least helps understand the boundary between my freedom of speech, if you like, mm -hmm. and the fact that I'm accountable for what I say being a government employee. Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned, you referred to a cultural clash, kind of cultural clash that may arise, so also we'd like to know about that. I mean, this has to do with the you know, never-ending discussion between digital natives and digital immigrants. Digital mm -hmm. native is somebody who's pretty young, who has always been you know, surrounded by technology, so they breathe and eat all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right, people like myself, mm -hmm. we actually learn this stuff, but it's not in our DNA. So what it happens is if you go through these you know, employee incentives and you say, well, I'm going to reward you if you connect with people through these new social uh, networks, mm -hmm. people like myself who don't really possess the ability to do much may feel you know, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to evaluating who has been the best employee, uh, what possibilities do I have not being a digital native to rank very well into the new connection world. Mm. So the point is, be very uh, you know, careful from the management perspective in balancing, you know, I want to encourage you, but I want to really discourage people who just don't get it, because mm. there is nothing you can do to make them get it. Mm. So finding the balance is an important thing from a management perspective. Mm -hmm. So also, what about social monitoring? You mentioned that this is a very important step for governments to take. So Yeah, social monitoring, uh, I want to be very clear on this because monitoring suggests government watches what people does. It's not mm -hmm. what I mean. What I mean is if you have multiple employees who are engaging themselves with citizens on, uh, on those social networks, it's very difficult, close to impossible, for managers to you know, monitor them. Mm -hmm. So social monitoring is about people watching out for each other. So mm -hmm. all those who are engaged in blogs or wikis or uh, social networks of all sorts should spend some time in looking for their colleagues. What is my colleague doing? And if you sense that something wrong is happening, just tell them. Mm. So that monitoring is brought down from the management level mm. to the people level, and that is very effective. A very good example is Wikipedia, mm. any wiki. Uh, you know, somebody makes a statement, it may be inflammatory or wrong, somebody else corrects it. It's the same principle. People help other people yeah. do the right thing. Yeah. So my final question is about open source, since you're an expert in open source. What do you think of the governmental shift from into open source from proprietary systems? Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, I've been dealing with this for many years, and the first wave has been we don't want to use proprietary and we want to use open. In reality is that anybody you, in government who buys open, buys open from a vendor. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, what this is becoming is just a wider choice of vendors, mm. so it's not just Microsoft, there would be somebody else if you like, uh, and greater openness uh, in terms of the products that are being used. But when it comes to the original, you know, the original drive that was, oh, I can do it myself, I can get rid of vendors, that's not going to happen. In fact, those who are benefiting most out of open source are the vendors themselves. Mm. Vendors have slashed their development and support cost by using open source, including Microsoft. Now, there is one other area of open source which is interesting, which is, you know, when governments develop their own specific applications mm -hmm. for which they don't find products in the market, if they develop that in certain ways using open source, they may engage other government agencies mm -hmm. and they create communities amongst themselves and they, they can collaboratively support the development and maintenance of these very vertical and narrow applications. That's a different dimension of open source. Mm. We call it community source because those are sm smaller community than just all the public. But that's an area where I think there is lots of mileage for open source as such. Mm. When you go to, you know, 
infrastructure software, operating system, uh, productivity packages, is just a market. So it has opened the market, but nobody is maintaining their own open source email system. They will just go to another vendor yeah. who happens to have an open source solution, but it's just a contract between you and that vendor. So you don't think that open source may, le may help governments have vendor independence since... Uh... Well, it is a sort of independence because if different people support, I don't know, open office would be uh -huh. an example, your documents are written in such a standard that if you change version, you can still use those documents. Mm. But that's it. You're still buying from a vendor. You're not actually insourcing the ability to, to maintain and develop the product. So in my view, open standards, which is what the document is about, are mm. far more important than open source. Mm. Whereas in the past, let's say five, six years ago, there was this uh, idea that open source would be almost free of charge. Mm. There is no such thing as a free meal. So you have to pay. You may pay less, and you can actually change restaurant having the same food. That's exactly what open source is about. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for this insightful interview, and we wish to see you again in Doha. Thanks a lot. Thank you.